afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started with uh, a presentation on uh, BEX, return of experience on, on projects in, uh, in Europe. Um, so I'm very glad to, uh, my name is Karim Romani. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Carbon Impact, which is a, a company specializing in BEX, in bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. So, um, uh, and I'm going to give you a bit of overview about what is BEX and also, um, you know, some return of experience on, on projects we are working in, in Europe. But I'm very pleased to have a, a panel uh, today to discuss this topic. So I'll let uh, the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, Emeric. Is this on? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Emeric Raymond from uh, Airfix Carbon, based out of Switzerland. Um, I'll talk mainly about the CO2 transport and long-term geological storage today. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Nasser O'Day from Ricardo Energy and Environment in the UK, based in Oxford. Um, I'm leading basically within the company on carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Um, and bioenergy, and today's my talk will be focused on the relevance of uh, BEX to energy from waste plants. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Nick Primer. I'm the policy advisor at Future Biogas. Uh, Future Biogas is a biomethane uh, producer operating in the UK primarily, and we have future BEX plant, uh, uh, future plans to develop some BEX plants. So, thank you. Okay, thank you guys. I think we have two people remote, but uh, I'm not sure they are already connected. Do you have someone online? Not yet. Okay, so uh, eventually we'll have also Florence from uh, Club CO2 in France, and uh, hopefully Eric Rylander from Stockholm Exergy, will, which is give us uh, a return on experience on, uh, on the project in Stockholm. So I'll just get started by uh, giving a, a quick overview on, on, on BEX for, for people, uh, just to remind on, on the general concept. Uh, but uh, first of all, uh, as I said, I'm, uh, I'm the co-founder of Carbon Impact and we are a company that does BEX uh, by capturing biogenic CO2 from uh, existing biomass plants. So typically we develop and uh, we build modules that capture CO2 from biomass plants and then we organize transport and sequestration to long-term storage locations. So that being said, uh, just to put things into context, so what is BEX and uh, what's the purpose of it and how does it work? So uh, I'll try to give you a some, some first um, uh, understanding of, of that. So first and foremost, BEX is one of the methods used uh, to remove carbon from the atmosphere. So we're, we're talking about CDR, carbon uh, dioxide removal, as a technology. And uh, uh, as you can see on screen, it's uh, one of the methods to fight against climate change. So the, the latest IPCC report from last year, Working Group 3 uh, 2022, in the, in the sixth assessment report, uh, emphasized that this is one of the methods which are necessary and avoidable to use the, the IPCC terminology uh, to uh, fight against climate change and reach the, the climate targets of not going beyond 1.5 degrees or even 2 degrees. And, and why is it needed? Well, it's needed because um, in order to uh, stay within affordable limits for the climate, we need to reach carbon neutrality and actually even after carbon neutrality to reach overall carbon negativity. So it means we'll, have to need, we'll need to have an economy which overall uh, sequesters uh, and captures more carbon than it's emitting in the atmosphere over time. And so carbon removal is a way to compensate for hard to abate emissions in the first stage, to decelerate the rhythm at which we are eating our carbon budget, and over time to reach carbon negativity because we have already put uh, over a thousand uh, gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere, which are today creating a problem for the climate. And so we are at 420 ppm, and we'll probably need to try to reduce, well, to not go too much above that, and then to reduce this level to a more safe uh, concentration over time. So that's the role of CDR in, in, in the scheme of things. So it's not at all something which replaces climate action. It's something that comes on top of it. Um, so, uh, and it helps to, re to reach climate neutrality, but not at all something which replaces aggressive decarbonization in all uh, other sectors of our activities. In terms of methods to do that, uh, you have a panel of possibilities. You can plant trees, uh, which is uh, somehow the uh, easiest to understand method, because trees, when they grow, capture CO2 from the atmosphere. But this method has limitations because you, you need to have uh, uh, resources to grow trees, you need land, uh, and so you cannot solve your way, your, the problem only with uh, planting trees. So you have a family, so you see on the chart, a family of methods that are available to do that. 
Some of them are displayed here, like biochar. When you uh, create biochar from uh, from um, biomass, which is sustainably harvested, and you uh, put it in the soil, so it's one way to sequester carbon. You can also sequester carbon in soils by changing your agricultural practices. Uh, you can sequester carbon in the oceans. So yeah, you have people working on different approaches to ensure we use the ocean sink and we boost it and we use it in a better way. And then you have uh, technologies which take CO2 from the air, either directly, like direct air capture. So you have plants which take CO2 from the air and then sequester it uh, in permanent sinks. It's one method, it's very energy intensive, but it's one approach that can be done and start to be implemented. And then you have BEX, and BEX is what we're gonna focus on today. So what is it? It's a method that consists in doing a number of things. So first, you need to have biomass. So we let the plants uh, re uh, take the, the, the CO2 from the atmosphere using photosynthesis, which is a process that was developed by nature in the last three, four billion years, right? And uh, then you use this sustainably harvested biomass into uh, different processes that use the biomass, like combustion, fermentation, digestion, or gasification. And these processes generally uh, emit CO2 in a gas form. And uh, in BEX, we take this CO2, so we need to capture this CO2 out of the biomass plants, uh, and then to compress it for transport and to do the geological se sequestration. And the other benefits of BEX, of course, is that you have some energy output in the form of fuels, hydrogen, methane, or, or directly heat or power. So you have both as an output energy and a carbon benefit, a climate benefit, uh, for, uh, by, by putting the CO2 in, in uh, permanent sinks. So if you look at the history about, uh, try to look about where this conce concept came from. So it's a, a concept that has 20 years. And initially it was developed, I think, uh, in 2001, there was a first, um, uh, a first um, publication in science about how theoretically taking CO2 from biomass plants could result in managing the climate risk. And so that was really the first kind of thinking about uh, what's the benefit of this approach in a really theoretical way. I think it was developed in Sweden because they, they have lots of biomass used to do paper. And there was the thinking of, okay, why not take CO2 out of these biomass plants? And this can give us a, a one tool to mitigate climate change. A few years later, the climate scientists took the topic and it appears in the first uh, simulations, the integrated assessment models in 2007. And so there, BEX appeared as a way to create some form of negative emissions, which was something new. So it was a way, somehow, I'm not a climate scientist, but it's a way to have a negative variable in the climate models. And this, it is the at that time, in 2007, the only way that was known. And so at the end, BEX became a kind of synonymous for uh, negative emissions, especially in the climate model and the IPCC reports. And then in 2018, there was a landmark report from IPCC, the 1.5 report, a special report, that showed what we need big, big quantities of carbon removal in order to stay within the climate uh, limits and, uh, uh, and the 1.5 uh, degree uh, scenario. And so at this stage, BEX kind of became probably uh, a victim of its success because you had models showing that you need billions of tons of CO2, uh, negative emissions. On the other hand, if you um, kind of reverse engineer the, the topic, uh, you found that you need huge quantities of biomass if you used only a method like BEX. And at the end, it was creating uh, constraints on the, uh, on the environment. And so this is where uh, it shows both the potential of this method and also some limits and criticism. And uh, in 2021, there was first attempts to try and put BEX in the right contact. Uh, so there was a report that uh, from uh, Julio Friedman and Roger Ains, among other people, who said, why not use, um, uh, introduce a new terminology
conditions with the right type of feedstock and uh, life cycle assessment. So speaking of potential uh, in, uh, in, in terms of full CDR, so you have uh, uh, worldwide potentially, let's say, depending on the models, between zero to five gigatons of, uh, uh, of, of carbon removal that can be done with BEX. It's a huge interval because we are early days in, in, in this technology, of course. What's clear is that it will not be enough to do all the negative emissions we need. So it's part of the uh, methods, uh, along with dark, afforestation, ocean, etc. But it's still significant. It, when it's done rightly, uh, I believe, we believe it can be a, a powerful tool uh, in, uh, in, in the fight against climate change. And to illustrate the potential, there was a study from um, 2021 done by uh, ETH Zurich that shows that you know, there's an estimate that in Europe we can do 200 million tons of, uh, of, of PEX. Uh, taking CO2 from various sources, like from waste incineration uh, facilities, from pulpable paper. Uh, Nasser will talk a bit uh, about waste specifically. Uh, I think, uh, Nick, you will focus on, on uh, the biogas facilities, which are another potential. If we have Eric on the line, he will be able to discuss about uh, the, the bioenergy. So there's a number of, uh, there's a big resources that can be used to, uh, to develop uh, BEX or bikers projects in Europe. And so when you think about BEX, actually, it's, you need to do four things. You need to, well, first of all, you need to start from a biomass plant which is existing, or you need to build it. And then you have a sustainable um, biomass uh, feed. But then the first thing you need to do is to capture CO2 from that biomass. So you generally, you have CO2 in a gas mix, and you need to separate it and compress it so that it's ready for transport. Second step, you need to transport the CO2 to a storage location. Third step you need to durably sequester the CO2 so that it doesn't leak or go out back in the atmosphere. And then the final one, and this is the focus of this slide, is the, you need to, to pay for all these things, okay? Because today, uh, nobody's paying you uh, to, uh, to remove carbon from the atmosphere. And this is actually one of the main barriers today for the uh, um, implementation at large scale of th that type of methods. So who pays for carbon generally? You have two types of uh, financial sources. You have the compliance markets. So we're talking here about markets like the ETS in Europe that are uh, generally taxing carbon from fossil sources. Uh, and these are big markets, especially the ETS, which is the, the biggest one, but you have in other geographies, similar taxes on carbon. Uh, you have it in California. And when you look about the Paris Climate Agreement, it's one form of uh, context where you can start to have some carbon credits through Article 6 mechanism. On the other hand, you have a, a, a smaller market, but it, which is growing fast, which is the voluntary market for, ca for carbon credits. Um, and this one, it's more driven by commitments from different players who uh, say they will be climate neutral or, ne or, or negative even, and that are ready to pay voluntarily for people uh, like, uh, like the BEX developers, among others, to, uh, to remove carbon from the atmosphere. So... Today, voluntary markets are driving the demand for carbon removal. Typically, uh, you see here on Net Zero Tracker, there's a number of cities, countries, companies, uh, and, and, uh, and regions that have committed to be net zero or climate neutral. To do this, they need to reduce their emissions first, but then they have also, for the residual emissions, they cannot, uh, they cannot remove, use carbon removal methodologies. And the number of people, act players, who have committed to such kind of commitments is growing. On the other hand, you have some uh, players who have put in place advanced market commitments. So these are mechanisms which come initially from the pharmaceutical uh, industry and specifically from vaccine development, which are specifically uh, designed to address the chicken and egg thing. Today, you don't have demand to do carbon removal, but on the other hand, uh, you don't have supply because there's no demand. So these uh, advanced market commitments, like the one driven by Frontier or one driven by the First Movers Coalition, they say, okay, we're ready to buy a number of uh, carbon removals as soon as you provide a certain level of standard of quality. And these early pioneers are driving the early demand for, on top of um, some subsidies and some states which are helping those, uh, uh, those um, efforts to, uh, to today generate carbon removal credits, including BEX, uh, BEX uh, in the mix. 
So that was the first, maybe the last point, but the most important, which was the financing. And financing is coming, so you have now sources of capital uh, that are ready to, uh, you know, support the emergence of the first carbon removal projects. Then you have the technology. So that was the first step, taking CO2 from a gas mix. And here you have also a vibrant mix of technologies which are adopted to BEX, but also to CCS, to fossil CCS. And uh, they have different levels of maturity. So you, you, you have a absorption, absorption technologies, which use basically solvents, chemicals in general, that are going to absorb CO2. And then when you, you regenerate the CO2 by heat or by pressure, and, and then you get the pure CO2, which you can use to sequester. Uh, you have adsorption technologies, which are a bit the same, but using solids, um, uh, same principle. Uh, and and uh, this is uh, a less mature field, but it's uh, emerging fast with uh, advances in material technologies, in new materials such as MOFs, uh, which are coming on the market. You have cryogenics, which is a method which is proven in industry, uh, but today uh, not yet widely deployed for carbon capture, but some applications where CO2 is highly concentrated can, um, uh, can use that kind of technology. You have membranes, which is a, a, like a, a very mature also a methodology, which is physically separating the CO2 from other um, molecules. And then you have systems which are more biology inspired, like uh, using algae. And so there's a landscape of tech. The, the, the technology maturity is various, so uh, uh, the, the solvents today are the more uh, deployed and the most advanced along with membranes, but it's a quite active uh, field with many developments to watch in the next few years. So just to conclude, uh, the way we are trying to do, so we are, we are a, a small company, but we have uh, started to develop already uh, some, some projects. Typically, we have a nice collaboration going on in Switzerland. Uh, for some reasons, there are many pioneers in uh, climate action in, in, in Switzerland, which is nice. Um, and so we're partnering with, uh, um, first of all, a utility, a local utility near Zurich, which have a number of biomass uh, plants uh, in operation. We're partnering with Airfix, so Emmerich will explain uh, uh, how they are supporting us to uh, do the logistics of the CO2 from Switzerland, which has no ports, and it's a landlocked, uh, landlocked country, but there's possibilities to sequester the CO2 uh, mostly in the North Sea today uh, in Europe. Uh, South Pole, are happy, which is the parent of Airfix, uh, is helping us with the certification of the credits and the sale of the carbon credits. Um, and then for geological storage, we're looking at options in the North Sea, like Northern Lights in Norway, or uh, Carfix in Iceland, which are developing a nice methodology uh, to mineralize uh, the CO2 in situ. So that is a project we're working on right now. We have to, we hope to have a CO2 uh, buried in the ground uh, sometimes around 2026 with, with this one. Uh, so starting uh, with a few thousand tons, but hopefully this will be the first in a, a series of projects uh, going forward. So that was on my end. I will now uh, leave the floor to our panel, uh, to our panelists, to speak about their own experience on uh, developing Bex uh, project. So Nasser, I think you have a train, so I let you jump in for your presentation. Thank you very much, Karim. Very interesting presentation, and actually leads very well into my my presentation. It's uh, the one Ricardo. Ricardo. Uh, should I just go forward? Uh, it's, uh... Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Um, apologies, as, as Karim mentioned, I need to catch up my train, so I'm doing this, and I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. I'll, I'll sit down, but I might have to leave early. Um, so the agenda for today, as you can see, uh, BEX has many faces, and here I will focus uh, on an important one. Uh, my topic is basically focusing on the relevance of BEX 
for energy from waste plants, incineration plants. Uh, I mean, I'm not presenting a specific case study. Uh, I, I, we took, I discussed yesterday in one of my presentations about the Biocus system. This is a system uh, Ricardo are developing, uh, which, which is a hybrid system of BEX and biochar uh, in, in collaboration with our partners, Wittek Engineering and Blue Box Energy in the UK. And I would ha be happy to answer any questions on that you know, you might have going forward. But for today, the focus is, and, and obviously this, a lot of this has, Karim has already talked about it. Uh, just first of all, let me tell you a little bit about Ricardo. Ricardo is a, is a global engineering, environmental and strategic consultancy operating across a wide range of sectors. Um, we are present across all countries, uh, uh, all continents, sorry, in, in 21 countries and 55 sites worldwide. Basically, we operate in the automotive um, industry and car engine uh, design, uh, rail, electric cars, as well as hydrogen and rail. Ricardo Energy and Environment uh, is where I am based, uh, provides wide range of consultancy services, including sustainability, waste management, air quality, sustainable transport, chemical emergency. Uh, we support clients on net zero uh, and developing industrial decarbonization plans and heat decarbonization. Uh, we work with the public and private sector, uh, you know, in developing uh, feasibility studies, designs, um, as well as owners, engineers, um, life cycle assessment, scope one, scope two, and scope three studies, uh, we develop tools, for example, for bioenergy, um, and uh, also we have a very strong practice on energy from waste, uh, incineration, CCUS, uh, CO2 removals, uh, biorefineries, and so on. So in terms, my focus would be now on basically uh, on BEX. Bioenergy with carbon capture, utilization, and storage is essential as Karim mentioned, for, uh, as an essential, essential carbon removal option. It is now clear, as you, as you know from the Paris Agreement and uh, the IPCC report, that uh, emission reduction on its own is not enough. We need removals. Um, the Paris Agreement was the first to emphasize this fact. Uh, for the two degree scenario and the 1.5 degree scenario, obviously, uh, you need to remove carbon. All, almost all the two degree scenarios include uh, carbon removals in them. CCS is key to achieving that. It is now clear that carbon capture, utilization, and storage needs to be part of the solution. Maybe 20 years ago, this was not, this was not the fact. Carbon removals, sometimes called greenhouse gas removals, as in the UK, or uh, carbon dioxide removals in Europe, uh, or simply negative emission technologies, come in different phases, as you can see in this diagram, including uh, biochar, direct air capture, and also nature-based solutions. BEX is a key one, and it's reported in, uh, it has a potential of 300 to 800 million tons of CO2 per year by 2050 in Europe. There are several BEX conversion routes. Energy from waste is one of them. But also, you will hear later from future biogas on BEX on, on green gas. Uh, again, Karim talked about this in detail, so maybe I should just uh, con uh, to continue with my presentation. In terms of BEX, currently uh, there are more than 20 BEX plants which, which demonstrate the full CCS chain, and these are all of them are ethanol plants. The challenge is for power BEX, energy from waste BEX, and other, other sectors basically to bring BEX as part of the solution. Uh, ethanol plants are an easy target because of the very high concentration in the, in the outlet stream. For energy from waste, this diagram shows a comparison of negative emissions for a case with and without CCS. Assuming 50% biogenic content and 90% CO2 capture rate, an energy from waste plant, as you can see, with CO2 capture and permanent storage, and the permanence is very important here, permanent storage can have a significant negative emission impact or potential. Increasing the, obviously increasing the biogenic content of the waste improves the carbon removal potential of BEX energy from waste. Obviously methods for determining the biogenic content in the waste are key, are a key element of the MRV process, which obviously 
there, there is a demand or there's a need to develop MRV processes for monitoring uh, carbon in and carbon out, whether it is stored permanently or not. But how established are CCUS technologies? Uh, the previous presentation touched slightly upon this. Uh, again, CCS is a combination of well-established and readily available technologies. So when you talk about CO2 capture, CO2 transport, CO2 storage, these are all established technologies. It's not, it's not something new. Um, for carbon capture, the CO2 is separated from clean flue gas, conditioned, and then compressed or liquefied. This is well-established. Amine systems, potassium carbonate systems are well established and technology providers worldwide. Uh, it is established in the chemical sector for hydrogen production from steam methane reforming and also uh, in the gas sweetening, natural gas sweetening sector. CO2 pipeline transport is again is well established technology. You have thousands of kilometers of CO2 transport pipeline in the US, so it's not something new. Uh, CO2 utilization exists, food and drink sectors, greenhouses, abattoirs, urea, manufacturing. But the challenge obviously is developing new techniques for utilization which store the CO2 permanently. Uh, you know, with many of these applications, the, the CO2 leaks back into the atmosphere. Concrete curing, for example, cement, green cement, and other applications are key emerging technologies for storing the CO2 permanently. Storage, again, geological storage or injecting CO2 in aquifers for enhanced oil recovery and gas recovery is a is well-established method. The big challenge is that the CO2 capture process is energy intensive and it requires very high energy. For power plants, for example, it requires from three to four megajoule per kilogram of CO2 captured. And this hinders the development or has over the years hindered the development of, uh, you know, CCUS. Uh, there are obviously ways of reducing this. I mean, there are new technologies that are being developed to, to reduce this energy penalty. Uh, in Europe, uh, the Directive directive 2009-31EC, uh, this, this, the Directive on Geological Storage of CO2, uh, obviously is the legal framework uh, for the environmental safe and safe uh, geological storage of CO2. The Innovation Fund, Just Transition Fund, connecting Europe facility, all these support CCUS projects in Europe. So the projects are being developed, are being funded. So the energy from, the energy from waste sector faces a challenge in Europe. There are, I mean, things may not look good for energy from waste, incineration plants, but despite the current policy in Europe, CCUS on energy from waste uh, presents a real opportunity. For example, but some of the challenges are that the waste incineration, waste incineration is against the principle in Article 17.1 uh, uh, of the taxonomy regulation. Uh, and there is a target in Europe by 2035 uh, for the circular economy package uh, to 10% cap for landfilling and 65% municipal, municipal solid waste recycling. So this is a challenge for incineration of waste. Uh, EU policy is, uh, is to have actually to, to, to reduce by 100% total residual waste by 2030. However, again, despite all of these challenges, Europe will need to deal with 140 million tons per year residual waste by 2035. So more energy from waste will have to be built. And as you can see from this diagram, there's a challenge for energy from waste. What energy from waste plants have a control of is installing carbon capture and storage rather than reducing, for example, or eliminating plastics uh, from the residual stream. In the UK, uh, in 2021, uh, the report to Parliament urged support to enable existing energy from waste plants to be retrofitted with CCUS before 2030. So things are happening in the UK. Examples of energy from waste with CCUS are already in planning in Europe. The Oslo, uh, in Oslo, for example, you have the Fortum, uh, Oslo Varm plant, uh, the C4 Copenhagen clusters have two energy from waste plants. So things are happening in Europe. There are some developments. And there's a real opportunity for uh, energy from waste plants with district heating. So energy from waste with district heating schemes offers an excellent opportunity, which I will discuss in a minute. So my next part of the presentation will talk about the opportunity for energy from waste and the challenges which need to be overcome in retrofitting energy from waste plants with carbon capture and storage. It is true that 
CO2 capture reduces efficiency by more than 30% due to the low pressure steam demand. So if you have a power station, it, uh, its efficiency will reduce significantly um, as, as a result of drawing steam for the carbon capture process. But if, it's if this is integrated with CHP systems, this efficiency uh, loss reduces significantly. In addition, useful heat can also be recovered back from the capture process and fed into district heating. So it is, it is both ways. You need heat from the power station, but also you can recover heat from the capture system and feed that into district heating. Heat from the, the flue gas cooling process, gas compression, for example, and other processes is available at different temperatures, 60 to 110 degrees. Uh, previous work shows that additional heat recovery improves the plant efficiency and economics, leading to 25 to 30% reduction in, in uh, in capital cost, in, in obviously improvement in efficiencies. Uh, of course, some processes such as hot potassium carbonate, for example, will have an advantage over amines because hot potassium carbonates are done at six bar to seven bar. Uh, that compression, you can recover the heat back. With the amine system, you, you're doing the, basically you're removing CO2 at atmospheric pressure. So th there are, depending on the technology, there are some advantages. In terms of what legislation needs to, needs to be uh, you know, obviously what uh, adapted to, uh, to help this happening in Europe. The Energy Efficiency, Efficiency Directive has a definition of economically justifiable heat demand or useful heat. Uh, so at the moment, any heat taken from the energy, energy from waste plant or any power plant and fed into the capture process is not considered as useful heat. This needs to be adapted, a, the EED needs to be adapted to allow or to consider this heat as, as if it was leaving the boundary of the power station or the energy from waste plant or the district heating plant and considered as useful heat. So this presents, previous slide, pre previous slide presents a real opportunity for energy from waste plant with district heating, especially when combined with CHP, combined heat and power. But there are some challenges to be overcome. Uh, one of these challenges is the layout and space availability. If you are, for example, if an energy from waste plant considering retrofitting carbon capture and storage, uh, you know, you need to consider space uh, as well as the additional utility requirements for the carbon capture plant. Also the availability of land, maybe next door. Another challenge is uh, energy from waste plant uh, operation and carbon capture plant integration. You need to consider uh, basically excess air uh, for emission performance and its impact on the solvent, solvant utilization uh, plant overall efficiency changes, uh, whether possible, whether it is possible to integrate with heat networks again, uh, uh, as well as the power output loss, which we mentioned earlier. And finally, solvent selection is an important aspect, whether it is potassium carbonate or amine systems, it's important to consider. And finally, one of the challenges is the emission modeling. Uh, air emissions, obviously, are, is, a, is an important aspect. While you capture the CO2, you are causing some externalities somewhere else, which need to be looked at. Some other emissions, like for example, if you are using an amine system, uh, amine might slip into the atmosphere. And this is a challenge which needs to be addressed. When you have a single plant, that's not a big issue. But if you have th this technology widespread all over Europe or all over a certain country, then that needs to be taken into account in dispersion modeling. So in terms of the first challenge, um, Typical footprint uh, for a uh, carbon capture system varies, varies, but potentially from 500 to 1,000 meters, meters squared for 100,000 tons process, 100,000 tons of waste. Um, and obviously there is innovation ongoing to reduce cost, uh, to develop more compact systems, more modular systems. I mentioned earlier our Bioca system, which Ricardo is developing with our partners, and this is a modular, basically compact system to help reduce the, the, the footprint. The key point to consider in the design, obviously, in the design aspects is to include CO2 capture, but also other utilities as part, of, and, and the control of the plant, obviously, as part of the, of the design. And in terms of um, CCUS plant integration, um, obviously, you have to one of the key issues is a real issue is the oxidative degrading uh, in, CO, in the CO2 absorber, obviously of the, of, the, of the amine solvent, for example. This is a real issue 
and it can happen at elevated temperatures uh, in the stripper or between the absorber and the stripper. A uh, potential solution is the removal of the dissolved oxygen uh, from the rich solvent through, for example, using a membrane. However, uh, this is still under development uh, and impacts are still uncertain. So you will always have, you need always, for example, in an amine system, you always need uh, amine makeup because you still have significant amounts which adds to the cost because you're always losing the amine. And the other, other aspect is the plant overall efficiency. Uh, this is another challenge. This is the energy, energy penalty, as I discussed earlier, 25 to 35%. Uh, this can be dealt with through use of alternative uh, designs and solvents. Uh, for example, now uh, a company in the UK uh, is developing solvents which are 2.2 megajoule per kilogram of CO2. Much lower energy penalty than the for conventional amine solvents of 3 to 4 megajoule. Uh, also, heat integration, as I mentioned earlier, uh, within the system uh, and also utilizing the heat within district heating is an important aspect to deal with this overall uh, plant efficiency. And solvent selection, again, uh, I think uh, just repeating what I said earlier about the fact that you can, uh, there's a difference between potassium carbonate uh, and, and uh, amine system. For example, the Stockholm Exergy, you might hear later about from Stockholm Exergy, they are using potassium carbonate process uh, integrated with district heating, which significantly reduces the energy penalty and makes the plant very efficient. Um, and a very important challenge is the air emission monitoring. Um, you know, introducing carbon capture, as I mentioned earlier, uh, particularly amine systems, introduces additional air emissions. As you can see from this diagram, uh, amines can translate into nitrosoamines, which are carcinogenic. And that needs to be dealt with, whether through water wash or perhaps other means. But uh, when, you, when you deploy carbon capture at a very large scale, this needs to be taken into account. So air, air emissions are very important to deal with. There are several levers which can be uh, considered to reduce air emissions. Uh, again, careful solvent selection, cleanup of the flue gas prior to CO2 capture. Uh, removal of, of NOx, for example, SOx and uh, particulate matter, and also removal of ammonia uh, and other constitu constituents after carbon capture, uh, and also consider um, effective stack design and flue gas heating to aid plume dispersion. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take any questions now if you, if you have any questions. Okay, apparently it was clear. Thank you, Nasser. So, uh, same here. If you had any uh, questions on on the initial introduction uh, of of of, uh, of uh, the the Bex concept, feel free to uh, to 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 ask us now or, or later uh, uh, if if you wish. And uh, Nasser will need to leave us uh, around um, yeah, a bit less than half an hour or something like that for a train. So please excuse him in advance for leaving the the panel. Um, so we have the next uh, person on stage, but coming in 10 minutes. Uh, what I suggest uh, is to maybe have a first uh, chat. Uh, let's let's use the time to um, um, to uh, have uh, some 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 general um, uh, Q and A uh, on on the topic, and then we'll have. Uh, uh, Eric Rylander from Stockholm Exergy, which will present his project they are working on in uh, the biomass uh, unit of Stockholm in around uh, in a bit less than, than 10 minutes. Uh, and he will be uh, presenting his uh, return of experience uh, in a remote, remote way. Uh, so maybe I'll use the fact you're here with us, Nasser, to shoot the first uh, number of questions. So now regarding overall, you mentioned the number of uh, challenges and opportunities in the waste to energy. When do you think and you know, open to you to have uh, you know, an answer or not to this question. When will we see the first project online, be it in Europe and the UK, in your opinion, for waste to energy uh, BEX projects? In considering, obviously, the requirements in the UK now and, and also in, in Europe, the challenges facing energy from waste in Europe, uh, energy from waste have no choice but really to start thinking about carbon capture. As you can see from CWIP, the Confederation for Energy to Waste Energy Plants in Europe. Uh, 
you know, carbon capture utilization and storage is very high on their agenda. So I would expect, uh, I think this is analysis we do re usually for clients and we work very, very closely with governments, for example, currently with the Scottish government and so on. I would expect the first energy from waste plants to come uh, online before 2030. And this will be towards the second half of the 2020s. But this is, this is like some of the early starters. I mean, obviously there are some low hanging fruits in terms of BECs as, you know, bioethanol, biomethane sites, but energy from waste is one which has no other choice but to decarbonize through, through uh, carbon capture and storage. And do you? Th I understand that now in the EU, maybe not in the UK, but in the EU, there will be uh, um, there is talks about including the energy from waste plants into the ETS scheme as soon as 2028. Uh, is that something that might uh, even accelerate the timeline for for projects, uh, or or not so much? Absolutely. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of campaigning at the EU level happening now at the moment. I mean, you can see from uh, the Nordic countries, like what's happening in, in Norway and what's happening in, 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 um, in, in Denmark and other countries, energy from waste plants with carbon capture are actually being built. And yes, definitely this will encourage more of these plants to, to uh, uh, retrofit carbon capture. Okay. Uh, Emric, maybe you see some activity on Iran in Switzerland in, uh, in, in the sector. Could you uh, also uh, give us some comments or maybe uh, predictions regarding what's happening um, in, in, in our neighbor Switzerland? Uh, sure. Um, in Switzerland, actually, they do not plan to have um, waste to energy plants join the Swiss ETS as early as 2028. However, the counter part for that, uh, it was an agreement between the Ministry of Environment and the waste to energy sector that they have to build at least one plant capturing at least 100,000 tons of CO2 per year by 2030. Um, so the main project in Switzerland now is called Kafao Lint, um, and they are actually planning to be online 2027, 2028, capturing and storing um, 100,000 tons of CO2 per year. Um, and they created a, a, a center also um, organized by the Association of Waste to Energy Plants to really build the capacity of the whole sector on the topic. Okay, so I take from, yeah, I have a question uh, here in the, in the room. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, go ahead, uh, or we can bring you a microphone. Oh, there it is. Thank you. I have a question regarding Switzerland. Um, Will it be the approach like Climeworks capturing CO2 from the air or will it be connected to the cement factories and capturing directly from the production? Um, so this is point source, cap point source capture. So directly from a waste to energy plants capturing the flue gas, separating the CO2 and um, storing and li liquefying and storing that CO2. Um, so it's a different model. It has the additional complexity of um, trans having to transport it to where it can be geologically stored, but it has the benefit that in the flue gas, the concentration of CO2 is much higher than the air. Yeah, but uh, because I, I come from Geneva myself and uh, they did do a lot of geological research recently, but more from, uh, for the geoenergy in order to do it with the hot, like through the hot water, through warming it up, but not for carbon storage. I haven't heard of any studies f to do CCS in Switzerland. In which areas has that been done? So in general, the geological storage available in the next three to four years is mainly in the northern countries. So Denmark, Norway, um, and most offshore. Um, Switzerland, they did do a initial analysis on the geological um, composition of the, the subsurface, uh, which was not so conclusive. Um, it's not a country that has a big oil and gas pass, so they haven't done much research on the topic. Mm -hmm. um, but now seeing the need, they are, um, the government is trying to push also um, private sector to s analyze this in more detail and start some pilot projects there. But this will not be, um, usable for the first projects. The first projects will have to transport the CO2 from Switzerland um, to northern countries, so Denmark, Norway, or potentially Iceland, where CarbFix is also working. 
I feel I shouldn't have gotten the microphone. I occupied it a lot. <laughs> but uh, since we're talking about transportation, because that's important for bags or for any kind of captured CO2, it requires a lot of reconstruction of pipelines or transportation by what? By trains, by vessels, by... So, so Emmerich will have a presentation specifically on the transport of CO2 in Switzerland. And we have Florence coming up later at 3.30, which will discuss what are the prospects for a CO2 infrastructure in France. So be patient and you'll have uh, your answers. Okay, thank you. Um, unless there are other questions in the room, yes, please. Thank you. Luc Pelkmans from IEA Bioenergy. Um, Nasser, I believe you, you mentioned the energy pe penalty for capturing the CO2 from flue gas. Uh, do you know how this compares to, uh, to direct air capture, which was now mentioned? Yeah, I mean, direct air capture, obviously, because of the very low concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere, talking about three times higher than, for example, capturing CO2 from flue gas. So nine megajoule per Per kilogram of CO2 for direct air capture while again for conventional solvents about three to four megajoule but again this is being reduced at the moment so yeah direct air capture is is a big challenge and uh, it's going to take time for that to, to be reduced okay great i understand we have uh, rick rylander from stockholm exergy uh, online so he will present his return of experience on on that project uh, remotely so eric the floor is yours Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can even see you. So I will try to share my screen then. Okay. So thank you very much for um, for having me. Uh, my presentation is about uh, Bex and uh, taking bags to the uh, to the market really uh, because uh, i think you've already heard quite a bit of technical presentations on bags uh, i hope to be able to to um, give to you some some information on how we experience the uh, going to market uh, journey all right so first a few words on stockholm xd um, Stockholm XD, we are a district heating company uh, located in Stockholm. Uh, we uh, sell heating, cooling, electricity uh, as our predominant business. We are owned to 50% by the city of Stockholm. And at present, 99% of our production is made up of recovered or renewable, it comes from recovered or renewable sources. And the next step now we're aiming for is to become the largest supplier of CO2 removals with permanent storage in Europe. So first, a few words on BEX. Uh, this may be familiar to, to some of you, but maybe not all. Uh, so just to explain what is BEX compared to, for example, conventional CCS. So, so first of all, we are a company very much focused on renewable energy. So the bioenergy circle you see on the left side in this slide. Um, and, you know, the idea of bioenergy being net zero is really that the, the, um, the plants and trees, they will absorb uh, carbon dioxide via the photosynthesis as they grow. The carbon is then bound in the biomass. We use uh, forest residue uh, in our en energy plants uh, as fuel. And the energy that we would, uh, the carbon that is then, the carbon dioxide that is released upon uh, incineration of the biomass is then the same carbon dioxide as once was taken up by the trees from the atmosphere. And, and as this residues from the forest industry is, is, uh, is sludged, the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the lowest grade of bio biomass, so to say, which would be left in the, in the forest uh, and, and would, would have oxidated in a few years, this is a what what we would call a closed loop of, of net zero of no no carbon no, no new carbon coming out in the atmosphere what we do with bex is that we we, we cut this loop and instead of uh, sending the carbon back to the atmosphere uh, when we uh, incinerate the biomass we capture the carbon and send it to geological storage so in that way we have taken carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sent it back into the ground 
uh, using the trees and the photosynthesis, a very efficient way to do this. This shall be uh, kept separate from in, uh, what we normally talk about as CCS, because that is normally something with using fossil raw materials and then capturing carbon, making sure that no new carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere. But with this technology, you can at best reach a zero process, whereas BEX will generate negative emissions as carbon is actually taken out of the atmosphere. So our project in, in Stockholm is about installing a BEX unit on an already existing CHP, a, a pure biomass CHP, and this will allow us to remove 800,000 tons of CO2 from the atmosphere every year. Uh, and actually 800,000 tons, to put that in perspective, uh, that is as much emissions as you will have from traffic in Stockholm on a yearly basis. So it's quite a lot. What is fairly unique about our project is that this plant will then also be connected to the district heating system, allowing us to recover all the energy that we send into this uh, capture process, all the electrical energy needed to, to separate the carbon dioxide. We can recover all that energy as district heating in the end. So there is basically no energy loss in this process. All the energy and the fuels going in will still be delivered into the city. A little less power than before and a little more heat, but still the same amount of energy. We do this from sustainable biomass, and there will be no, no uh, additional outtake as this plant is already in place. And we will not take out more biomass just because we install, install the, the, um, the BEX plant. We have a highly, fairly high uh, concentration of carbon dioxide in our flue gases, around 19% which has allowed us to choose the HPC technology for this, uh, this plant. Uh, and the HPC chemical being a very environmentally friendly chemical that is actually present in food. Uh, this is a good choice for a plant situated in the middle of the city. So in order to do this investment, which we plan to, we, make, we, we are actually, we have now completed our feed study uh, and, and we are preparing for an investment decision in a year from now. Uh, so the investment decision will be in the beginning of 2024, and we will go into a commercial operation by the end of 2026. Uh, in order for this to be possible, we are leaning on three funding legs. So first of all, we have already received funding from the EU Innovation Fund. Uh, in the first round of the Innovation Fund, we received 180 million euros. Uh, and this is obviously a very important part of our funding, but it's still less than 20% of the money we need over the uh, grant period. So in addition to the uh, Innovation Fund, uh, we also uh, expect uh, Swedish state aid. There is a Swedish state aid program being prepared as we speak, uh, and the money is in the Swedish state budget already. Uh, however, even with that money uh, that we hope to get, uh, it will not be enough for funding the project. So we, in addition to that, we also look to sell uh, negative emissions on the market or the voluntary carbon market, which is norm as is always normally referred to. You can also see here on the timeline at the bottom that actually we have started to do this already in 2020 when we installed a pilot plant uh, that is actually running, has been running for two years now and is running as we speak. Uh, which is already standing on our on our uh, CHP site, separating carbon dioxide from the actual flue gases, but but at a very much smaller scale, obviously. So this is a summary of of the uh, value chain that we are now putting together, uh, and it's all connected to this already existing CHP that you see in the picture. So we are using certified biomass, uh, and then we will produce the power and heat and capture the carbon. And we will then send the captured carbon down to our harbor area where we will liquefy it and, and store it in temporary storage uh, containers in order to be able to transport it out using ships that will take it to permanent geological storage in saline aquifers uh, in the North Sea. And, and as you see here uh, by the... Um, this part of the screen. This, this is really the investment that Stockholm XCD does. So we will invest in the capture equipment and we will invest in the liquefaction and buffer storage, 
whereas uh, transport and storage is something we look to buy as a service. Uh, So the question is then, will we make it until 2026? And there are obviously a, quite a few challenges, but uh, we are confident that, that uh, there is a very good chance of doing this. Uh, transport and storage is one of the big challenges uh, since that part of the value chain we are not really controlling. We are hoping to, to uh, contract this, uh, this as, a, as a service, as I said. Uh, and and, uh, and timely access to, to those services uh, is obviously crucial. And there are many projects developing at this time. Uh, but it's also important that we can land a, a price for the service that makes the bus business case uh, viable. Then funding in general is also an issue. As I, as I uh, mentioned, we are looking to, to um, build this project on three funding legs. Uh, where the voluntary market is one and government funding or public aid somehow is, is another. Uh, and it's very important that the funding schemes for public aid are set up in a way that they allow co-funding between private and public money. This is not always the case. Uh, and, and we believe that to make Bex, the BEX industry get off the ground, we need to establish aid, st state aid systems that promotes trade, trade on the market. And this is the way to get the money into this equation that need that, that is missing. Uh, and this is the way to relieve the taxpayers from having to pay for all this. The third part I wanna, I wanna highlight is really the allocation of risk along the value chain, which is also th something that is, has not been sorted out yet. I mean, th this, this uh, value chain uh, this industry is, is a new industry and there is no standard setup for how this these kind of con chains of contracts shall shall be structured uh, so at this point it's not really clear what what risks are to be absorbed by the capture what risks are to be absorbed by the transport agent the storage um, the storage uh, or the customer of the negative emissions uh, and there are also no insurance solutions on the market yet for for this industry so there are a few things to sort out before before uh, the commercial operations can start okay so in the end there would be no backs unless there is a, a, a clear market demand and and uh, what you as you know the ipcc has since long concluded that negative emissions will be necessary in order to meet the uh, targets of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and they also conclude that we will need negative emissions with permanent storage uh, on gigaton level by 2050. So, so we need really need, need to establish this industry. But how will it happen? So, so what you see here in the picture is a typical trajectory of a country or a corporation towards net zero. What you see on, above the x-axis are the positive emissions that all companies and nations have. Those are, in order to reach net zero, those need to be reduced. We don't, need, we don't reach net zero by just removing carbon from the atmosphere. We need to reduce emissions by 90, 95% from where we are today. And, and but, even when we reach net zero, there will be emissions that cannot be avoided. And those need to be counterbalanced with negative emissions. And in order to claim net zero by, uh, by the standards of, of, of science-based targets, you need to first reach your residual emissions here in the purple on, on, this, on this slide. And then, so you need to reduce all emissions till you reach your residual and then you need to neutralize those remaining residual emissions with negative emissions with permanent storage. But in order for the industry to grow to, 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 to the level where they have the capacity, the negative emissions industry to grow to a level where they have the capacity to supply all these negative emissions by 2050, we really need to establish this industry now. So we think it's very important that apart from establishing clear trajectories for how nations and companies will reduce their emissions towards net zero. We also need to establish clear trajectories for how negative emissions will be phased in uh, so that we 
will eventually reach a point where there is enough negative emissions to counterbalance all the residual emissions that we will still have in 2050. This is another risk, the, the trinity of climate confusion. <laughs> this is a risk that, that uh, may slow climate investment down as where we are today. First of all, there is a confusion when it comes to reductions versus removals. Uh, we really need to keep these two separate. They are two separate activities. One is about making sure that we are cutting emissions. We are not emitting as much to the atmosphere as we do today. That is reductions. Removals is about taking carbon dioxide that has already been released out of the atmosphere. So, for example, CCS on fossil processes is not reductions. It is not removals. It is reductions. It's about avoiding to emit more carbon to the atmosphere. And, and this is very important when we set up rules that we are because there are different rules applying to reductions and removals. For example, reductions, the whole ETS system is about reductions, not about removals. So it's very important to keep these separate in order not to get confused. Another thing that is very important to, to, um, to, to appreciate is the difference between temporary and permanent storage of when, when you do uh, carbon removals. There are lots of, of important carbon removal technologies with temporary storage. However, Temporary storage does not have the same value over time for the climate as permanent storage does. And permanent storage solutions are normally much more expensive to, 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 to bring to the market. So unless the market appreciates the difference between permanent and, primary and temporary storage, we will have a big problem getting BEX and DAC uh, to the market. And then when it comes to national accounting, corporate, corporate carbon accounting, that there is also lots of confusion, uh, especially uh, in the, uh, when we talk about how the Paris Agreement shall be applied. We believe that we must keep national accounting and corporate accounting separate, just like we have always done with positive emissions, where corporates report emissions and then countries aggregate whatever corporates do. We need to do it the same way with negative emissions or, or carbon removals to keep the system separated, that is, not to confuse who can claim and who cannot claim. We need to be able to get both private and public money into this equation, and we will not be able to do that unless both private companies and nations can count the results. There are also positives going on. But Positive things go help this market get off the ground. And that is what the, probably the most important one is the carbon removal certificate framework that the EU Commission is right now developing. And, and this is obviously a very important initiative uh, because we know if there is no certification and uh, no, so to say, um, guarantee of what you are buying, there would be no market. Uh, and and, and so, so these certification schemes will definitely help uh, to, to uh, promote this to become a large market. However, at this point where we are now, and it has not yet, there's only a draft at this point. And, and we think it's very important that some improvements are, are taken up in, in the text. Uh, for example, at this point, we believe that there is too little of a demand view uh, looking at it when you look at the um, carbon removal certificate framework. Uh, at this point, the EU is very much looking how, how we can get supply going, but we think supply and demand come together and without demand, there would be no supply. So, so we need to get the demand view into the CRCF. We also think that they should speak out clearly about some things that have already been developed. For example, carbon farming, which has, there is a very good system for carbon farming. And that system is set up around that they want the voluntary carbon market, the farmers, to be able to help the nations to achieve the national uh, to, to achieve the objectives the climate objectives this is co-financing and co-claiming because we also in this system they also let the farmers claim that they have done this so this it should be spelled out clearly that the same goes for example bex and dax not only carbon farming it is not presently done uh, and uh, finally um we need to be careful when we write these 
certification frameworks, we need to be careful not to set an equal sign between different car uh, carbon removal technologies because they are not the same. Uh, in some cases, farming and, and, for example, technical negative emissions like BEX or DAX need to be treated differently. Uh, and, and when it comes to, for example, sustainability, which is extremely important when it comes to BEX being, being a, a good thing or not, you need sustainable biomass. Sustainable biomass should be regulated over red. Not, uh, for carbon farming, there are very many other principles you need to follow. So, so you cannot just treat everything equally. You need to see that they are different technologies, but you need to make sure that they are sustainable both both, both carbon farming and, and, and technologies like BEX need to be sustainable for sure. So, are you ready to be net zero? We, Stockholm XDR now, we are now coming to the market with, with our project. And as we speak, we are, have already started to, to uh, enter into offtake agreements with, with um, uh, customers that want to uh, sign up for this to make sure that this investment decision can be made uh, in a year from now, uh, and the the target the, the companies that or the customers that we are targeting at this point are companies that have uh, a serious net zero agenda, uh, and and thus are in need of these permanent removals in order to be able in the end to claim net zero, uh, neutralizing their residual emissions. And uh, so right now during 2023 we will enter these offtakes agreements uh, the certification methodology for bex has not yet been completely developed but we are working on it and it will comply with crcf obviously uh, or set a slightly higher standard but at least the crcf level the contracts that we are looking at right now are for 10 years uh, since we need stability in our revenues uh, to be able to make our investment decision uh, and the customers will then pay at delivery uh, year by year uh, simply okay that was my presentation thank you very much thanks very much eric i don't know if there are any specific questions in the room on uh, on uh, on your presentation please do you please have the mic uh, in front Hello, me again. <laughs> um, I have a question about your slide where you were saying that no bags is possible without market demand. Mm -hmm. Can you please elaborate on that a little bit? Because what we're talking here is the necessity that a removal and negative emissions are absolutely vital for us to achieve. I'm not even talking about two degrees, at least four degrees at mm -hmm. that point but you're saying that a market demand what did you mean i mean that uh, if we i believe uh, first of all in order to achieve bex or dax someone need to make the investment in the in the plant and either you set up a system where the nations will always pay for this investments or you let the private market um, be part of this uh, this transition uh, in any case at least for private companies like Stockholm XCD in the end someone needs to pay the bill and that's a kind of a demand if it's a nation that's de that demands it or if it's a private company that demands it it's it's not really making a difference uh, in the end when, when it comes to to uh, providing the money, but we believe that more money will come into this if we let both nations and private companies take part. Yeah, that is true. Just to conclude that um, in the CCUS conference in London in November, there was a phrase, we are trying to manage the market that does not exist. So pretty much uh, demand on that market I think it's like chicken and egg problem, right? Supply and demand have to contribute into each other. Thank you. Yeah, but I don't really, I mean, if you mean that there is no private demand at this point, I don't share your experience. Uh, there is 
quite a bit of private demand. Uh, we are in contact with several multinational companies and also Swedish local companies that are very interested in being part of this project and buying these products. So there is definitely a demand. But you need to make sure that public support systems like the EIF or, or for that sake, Swedish state aid in our case, is set up in a way that allows private money also to be part. That's a good thing. Thank you very much. Okay. Are there any uh, questions? Maybe I have one uh, last one for you, Eric. Is that uh, so? I understand you have the uh, innovation fund, which is financing part of the uh, installation, the capital, uh, the, the capex, basically of this project, um, and so some state aids uh, potentially as well. And then you're leveraging the voluntary market um, for getting payments year by year for paying for the opex, basically the operation of the of the system. Is that the right understanding, or do you also have a mix in the uh, in the opex payments uh, coming in? So the innovation fund is not a capital investment aid. It's a operations aid, actually. So we get the money from delivering the negative emissions. So we need to, to uh, prove that the negative emissions have been delivered and then we get the money. So it, it's not about investment support. It's, it's uh, operations support. Uh, the same goes for the Swedish state aid. We will we will know how much we get, but we will not get the money until we have produced the negative emissions. So, so it's, um, but but yes, we do have the, the uh, innovation fund grant. We do. We are looking to secure this money from the Swedish state aid, and and we also uh, are negotiating quite uh, a few uh, contracts on the voluntary market. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, if there's no further questions, thank you, Eric. You're free to um, if you be with us in the panel online or uh, switch off if you have other uh, other uh, commitments. I'm pleased to uh, invite on stage uh, Emeric Raymond from Airfix, who will uh, talk to us about CO2 transport and sequestration. Thank you. Thanks. And bye, Nasser. Thanks. Thank you, Karim. Yes, so thank you all for, for being here. Uh, so yes, my name is Amer Graymond from um, Airfix. We are a spin-off of South Pole, um, which is a leader in, in climate action for all. Um, my presentation will focus on the uh, more downstream part of the value chain, which is the transport and storage piece. Um, so really focus on the concept that we need a very inclusive CO2 transport and storage approach if we want to include all emitters and not just the large scale ones. Um, first, a quick word about uh, Airfix. So who we are, we are a one-stop shop for uh, biogenic CO2 emitters that want to do uh, BECs or bikers. Um, and what we will do is help them um, by on the carbon capture side, we would work with companies like Carbon Impact to help them define which technology is best suited to their plants. Um, we would aggregate the supply. So we are focusing mainly on small and medium sized emitters um, in order to pool the CO2 together, increase the volumes and make more efficient transport value chains um, to transport the CO2 from the point source um, to the storage site. We also work on the aggregation of demand, so creating pools of buyers of credits. Um, as Eric was mentioning before, demand for those, creating that demand and finding um, secure sources of revenue for future carbon removal is key to make these projects viable. So we also work on that piece. Um, and our last piece is really ad advocating for the rapid growth of the market. So this is working with the states, with associations of waste to energy, of biogas, of biomass incineration plants to try to get the market to um, move even faster. Um, right now, the EU has put BECs a bit in further down the, the line in its plans for carbon removal. So thinking about it more from 2035 to 2050, um, we think that we need to do BECs now um, and that we can actually already do it now. So why not start? So as I mentioned, uh, Airfix is a spin-off of South Pole. Um, so we are very closely linked with all South Pole activities. Um, we are very working, for example, with the CCS Plus initiative that develops methodologies 
for the certif monitoring and certification of the negative emissions. Um, so we work with our carbon projects teams as well. Um, we work with the next generation CDR facility, which is a, more or less a buyer's club that was created by South Pole last year in order to um, invest in CDR. Um, and we work with the portfolio of thousand clients that South Pole has that are working on their net zero strategies and that will need to compensate for their residual emissions. So what is the challenge that we have at hand? Um, we already know we have to remove around 10 gigatons of CO2 per year. Um, and just to, to have an order of magnitude, um, if we wanted this to be sort of CO2 that is transported and stored, this would be the equivalent of creating an industrial complex the size of the oil and gas industry right now. So this is a massive task if we want to reach the type of removals that um, were set out in the IPCC. And the main challenge I will focus on today is the fact that it needs to be available to all emitters. Right now, most of the talks at the EU level, at the national levels, we are talking pipelines and very large scale projects. Um, and of course, the pipelines will not be able to go and meet the demand of all the medium sized and small sized emitters. So everything below 100,000 tons of CO2 per year. And we think this is a missed opportunity because there is a lot of possibility, especially for biogenic CO2 emitters. There are a lot of them that are rather small to medium size um, and that could link up to this larger transport infrastructure um, if we develop a, a network that is more multifaceted and it has, that uses all types of transport um, that we have available at the moment. So how should, how should we think about this transport network? So a couple of key things that we have to think. It has to be very inclusive. So it has to be open to all types of emitters, all sizes, um, and all geographic locations. I'll come a bit later to a case in Switzerland, which is actually an interesting case because it's a landlocked country, um, but that also has access to uh, the Rhine River, so also can lose, use um, inland shipment transport. The network also has to be flexible. Um, we will have very small volumes um, or medium-sized volumes coming online in 2026. We will have much larger volumes coming online 2027, 2028, and we will have even bigger volumes coming online in 2030. Um, at the beginning, with smaller volumes, we won't have pipelines. We will have to use other modes of transport but this will have to switch and then integrate into a network where pipelines are exist. So when we think about this network already today for the first emitters that will come online, we have to think about a network that is flexible. It has to be efficient, of course. Um, so minimize the CO2 impact, so minimize the direct emissions of the transport, but also minimize the overall cost. Um, and finally, it has to be resilient. Right, we have to, especially right now, the storage uh, providers, so most of the long term geological storage providers, they work on a take or pay approach. So the CO2 has to be delivered, or even if it's not delivered, it has to be the capacity has to be paid because they cannot just shift that capacity to the next day. Um, so that means that you need to have a very resilient transport system um, in order to make it to reduce the risk of your project, basically. Um, so what's available today? Um, the, for smaller, smaller size emitters, um, the first mode of transport that's available is isotainers. Um, so isotainers basically maintain the CO2 um, in its liquid form at very low temperatures, um, relatively high pressure in order to keep the CO2, and it can keep the CO2 in its liquid form between 70 to 100 days, uh, depending on which solution. What, why is this interesting? So a lot of the, um, the smaller emitters, they don't have direct access to rail, um, so they need to link to rail or to ship or to ports uh, by using this sort of last mile or first mile transport. Um, so it's gonna be very important for those emitters. Um, 
it's quite expensive and quite high in terms of impact. So you want to reduce the amount of truck use um, in your in your uh, value chain, um, and it is quite li it's limited to quite small volumes. Um, for to give you an order of magnitude, one isotainer uh, can transport more or less 20 tons of CO2, not per year. So apologies for the mistake in the presentation. Um, so it can one isotainer transports 20 tons. So we just have to think about this in terms of wherever the we cannot imagine having uh, 100 uh, or 50 trucks going through a neighborhood at the same time every day um, that will create too much tension with local population. So it's an option that works for rather smaller scale projects. Then we have the rail transport. Um, and on rail, there are two options that already exist. One is taking that isotainer from the truck and dropping it until um, to a cargo train. The other option is rail tanks, um, which can take up more CO2, so around 60 tons, uh, which are sort of more efficient in a sense. However, the issue with rail tanks is they have a holding time for the CO2, which is lower, so around um, seven days. And for this reason, you have to think about how long your CO2 has to travel, um, whether it can take also a buffer in case your CO2 is blocked somewhere, uh, that you do not need to vent it and basically lose the, the impact that you are trying to achieve. So the good part is right now for medium, small to medium sized emitters, the rail network, the cargo rail network is sufficient enough to absorb those volumes. Uh, we can transport already now with rail. There are already, there is already CO2, uh, food grade CO2 being transported around Europe by rail. Um, in Switzerland, for example, it's 40,000 tons of CO2 per year that is already transported by rail for food for the food grade industry um, and other usage. So it it is available now and it is, um, well, relatively low carbon, depending on the grid uh, emission factors, of course. Um, it is, however, limited to small and medium size. If you have a very large amount of CO2, then it starts being uh, a constraint. So more or less between 55 and 15,000 tons of CO2 per year. And then finally, for um, the transport beyond, so a lot of the storage capacity is in the North Sea. So when this would require potential shipment from the ports of Rotterdam or Antwerp, and there you can use existing container ships that have the legal capacity to transport dangerous goods. Um, these exist also. It's also combining with existing routes. However, they're quite expensive and quite high in terms of CO2 impact. Um, also, they're quite, they do not leave much flexibility because they have a route and you have to follow that route basically, which means that you then have to uh, manage your last mile and first mile transport. So these are the transport options that already exist and that are available today and can be used already today. Um, in the near future, you have bulk CO2 chip shipping. So where CO2, um, where so ships are being uh, built by uh, Danunity, for example, for Carbfix and uh, Northern Lights, who is building their long ship project. So these are basically huge, huge ships that have uh, massive CO2 storage uh, capacity, so they can transport CO2, but they typically function on large scale. Um, so they're more or less their size enables them to transport 400,000 tons of CO2 per year, um, which means that for a small to medium sized emitter on their own, they cannot get access to such transport at the moment. Um, it is very cheap and relatively energy efficient. Um, it's usually both options right now are linked to storage providers. So Longship is linked to Northern Lights and um, then Unity is linked to Carbfix in Iceland. And they are quite flexible on where they can where they come and pick up the CO2, um, as long as there is a, a port that can take the, the size of the ships. Um, the second option that will also probably come in line in the next two, three years are dedicated uh, barges. So um, we, I didn't know this before starting to work in this sector, but there's a lot of inland transport in Europe through the Rhine, um, through the Danube, through different large rivers in Europe that are quite an efficient way actually of transporting cargo um, within Europe. And typically 
And here there are providers that are also looking at bulk CO2 transport, so barges that have containers inside for CO2. They're also quite cheap and energy efficient, and they're an interesting option for landlocked countries like Switzerland or even emitters. The, for example, the Rhine area in Germany is a very big industrial area, so there's also an it's also an interesting option for, for those emitters. However, one key problem with inland waterways is the vulnerability to water levels. So depending on how high or low the river is, the amount of CO2 you can transport on your ship varies. And for the resilient aspect that I mentioned before, this is a problem because you do not have a stable amount of CO2. And this is a problem that is aggravated with climate change because it's even harder now to predict the levels of rain that we're going to have and what are going to be the water levels uh, in the future. This summer, for example, was quite exceptional at how dry it was. And for a very long time, no, a lot of very low levels of volumes could be transported um, on the Rhine. And of course, I mean, this is limits access to emitters that are close to those waterways, but the truck and the barge together can work um, in, in that case. So to give you an idea, these uh, inland barges, they transport around 100,000 tons of CO2 per year if they're full. Um, but they have to adapt depending on the on the water levels. Finally, as um, the, the more famous transport option that we hope will really help scale the entire market is pipelines. So it will really help to pick, pick things up, uh, but most likely it will not reach small and medium sized emitters. And it does face a lot of um, sort of a challenge on public accept, ex, ex, well, sorry, uh, public acceptance. Um, so it's a, it will come, but it will take years for this to, to evolve. I think the first pipelines are planned for 2028, 2030, um, but most likely they would be widespread around 2035, 2040. And we cannot wait. We do not have the luxury of waiting 10 years before we start with the first carbon removal projects. We have to start them much sooner. Um, I wanted to just mention this uh, project that uh, was made in Switzerland, so Demo Up Karma, uh, from our partners at um, ETH. Um, South Pole is also a member of, of, the, of the project. So this was a pilot project to show, um, to basically capture a thousand tons of CO2 per year in Switzerland, in Bern in particular, and um, transport it to Iceland and store it uh, in um, in the carb fix, in basalt intense uh, earth. So the whole objective of this project was to show that the value chain exists, that it works, and already tried to figure out what are the different barriers along uh, the value chain, whether they're regulatory, whether they're logistical, in order to uh, make things happen. And this is what we're trying to replicate right now. So with Carbon Impact, um, the, the project that was mentioned before with Regional Werke Biden, um, where we will use uh, a mix of truck, rail, potentially also ship or direct rail to, to Norway or, or Denmark, where the storage areas are, um, in order to uh, capture, transport, and store um, several thousand tons of CO2 already in 2026. But I, I wanted to also leave you with a couple of thoughts on, the, on, this, um, on this piece. Right now, the storage is very much um, focused on the North Sea. And there are also some in the UK and Netherlands. Um, but in the future, I mean, France is also looking at the, their capacity um, to store offshore and potentially also onshore. Italy also has uh, potential projects. And that's where the flexibility is very important, right? Because right now, the only option for Swiss emitters is to go to Norway. But if suddenly a storage, um, or a storage capacity opens up in Italy, it makes much more sense to go there. But these are very long-term contracts. So you have to think about your value chain also in a way that can give you some flexibility, but still provide um, serenity to your providers and your service providers that you will have a long-term commitment to, to sticking with them. Um, I mentioned already the combination of transport options is key. Um, you could, so truck, rail is a great combo. Um, once, once you have bulk shipping, you can aggregate at specific points like the port of Rotterdam and Antwerp, which are 
starting to position themselves as CO2 hubs in Europe. Um, in a, the way of combination, you could also imagine for the resilience aspect to combine on the same route. So if you would go, for example, from Switzerland to the Netherlands, you could combine the rail and the waterway, so the inland barge, and have half of the CO2 go with one and half with the other. And based on the load capacity that you can go, um, that can go through the waterways, you can use the rail as a more flexible approach um, to compensate for the times that the water is too low to, to transport high volumes of CO2. So there are some combination of approaches that can be thought about in order to make the whole transport network more resilient. Um, one key aspect that we work on is aggregating volumes, right? Because the more volume we have transported, the more we unlock these more efficient, cheaper options like the bulk shipping, like the bulk barges. Um, and the more we control our own value chain. And um, intermediate storage will be crucial. So I think this is a point that's often a bit also forgotten. Uh, but when you have bulk transport, which is very efficient and it's great, it also means that you need to be ready to charge 400,000 tons of CO2 when the ship arrives at port, right? So that means that you need significant intermediate storage as well. Um, and finally, I think we have to really not forget the small and medium-sized emitters in these networks. So the truck will still be useful. And even if now we think, okay, there will be pipelines. So if we buy isotainers or if we implement isotainer transport, this will be useless in the future. This will not be the case because there will always be emitters that are not directly close to a pipeline or that cannot directly inject their CO2 in the pipeline. So you always need first and last mile transport. Um, yeah, so I think the main point of the presentation is that it is feasible and it is feasible already today. Um, so that's what we're trying to do and we hope we'll manage already with the first project in 2026. Thanks a lot for your attention. Don't know if there are any questions. Hi, uh, Luc Pelkman, IA Bioenergy. Um, I was wondering if the small and medium-sized applications and, and the idea of, of hubs of CO2, wouldn't that be more compatible with carbon capture and utilization uh, instead of, uh, of, of shipping it thousands of kilometers to, to the North Sea? So kind of, kind of looking at the balance there. So, so what's best because this, this long distance transport, I'm, I'm wondering. That makes it's, sense. A, it's a very good question, and I think that's uh, something that has to be evaluated in each project. However, we still do need removals, and we still need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, right now, the biogenic sources of CO2, which are also often the more small and medium-sized ones, um, they are the ones that have more monetary value on the market, um, also from a carbon market point of view, so carbon removals Go, can be claimed um, to be more expensive and um, versus avoidance. So if you would ship fossil um, emissions to, um, to Norway and put them on the ground, that would, not, that would count as avoided emissions. So even though it, it does make sense to, to, to look local, and I think if there is a local option for utilization that replaces fossil um, CO2, it does make sense to, to do that. But it is also important that we start building the infrastructure and the capacity to do negative emissions and carbon dioxide removals. And this is why we think it's important still to have some of those projects um, go in that direction. For the specific case of Switzerland, the CO2 usage is quite low. I think there's maybe 100 to 150,000 tons of CO2 consumed or used by industrials in Switzerland per year. So the demand is relatively low. Um, and in that case, it makes sense to, to go abroad. And of course, and I know the, the transport seems daunting because it's very far. Um, and you lose 
some efficiency by having to transport it far. But for example, demo up karma, which is very small scale, which is Iceland, so even further, the furthest that we will have, still has an efficiency of around 85%. Um, if you have higher volumes and go, for example, to Denmark, you can easily reach efficiency closer to 90%. Um, so with these numbers in mind, it still makes sense to, to go for, um, for, for the option of uh, CCS. Just, just because I'm making the comment, because yesterday in a session I was in, uh, so we had uh, CCU and the issues with CCU is, is the availability of biogenic CO2. Yeah. So they were really looking in the region, where can we get biogenic CO2? So I guess there may be some competition in the end where you want to store it or, or use it. So I think it was one of the bottlenecks that he mentioned. That, that it is a very good question and a very good point. I think um, it, will, it will come to a point um, and I guess it will depend on what is the final objective of the project. Um, so I think that's... Uh, but in the end, we, we will need both, I guess. That's, that's the solution. It's not an either or, it's, uh, it's both. Uh, uh, do I have time for a question? No. Yes, All I right, think so. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the presentation. It's really interesting, I think, uh, excellent work. And I think a lot of the development is waiting to see on the transport and storage infrastructure because there's a lot of cap carbon capture projects at the moment that uh, the bottleneck is in, in, in filling up the, the whole value chain. You, you spoke about the resiliency of the system based on the size of emitters, but I think we also have to acknowledge that there are multiple sources of CO2, multiple capture technologies leading to multiple or a range of quality of CO2 that needs to be injected in a common infrastructure. So how do you see the system and resiliency from, from the CO2 quality perspective and, and coming in from, from these different sources? Yeah, so right now, the quality of the CO2 specs are driven by the storage providers. So Northern Lights, for example, has the highest one, which is a very high, grade, high quality CO2. Um, there is a current discussion at the EU, um, in EU working groups right now on CO2 infrastructure to align basically on the specs uh, but not only on the quality of, CO of the CO2, but also at what temperature, what pressure should it be transported in order to avoid having to switch it from one sort of state to another in every time there's a change of transport option, right? So um, they are working to standardize this, but right now what, what basically what we are doing is knowing what the final need is of quality of CO2 we basically set this as the necessity for the emitters we would work with to deliver CO2 that is uh, aligned to those specs. Can I add another question? Yeah. Uh, so it was an interesting layout that you had of the different steps along the way. I think that's a, a quite a relevant question at the moment. For example, if you're thinking about comp compression and liquefaction, there's always a discussion of you need to do the liquefaction on site or you will have intermediate stages and so on. So how did you come to a conclusion on the, the, the right, let's say, location of these different steps in, in, in that project? I guess, I think on the liquefaction, I mean, the liquefaction usually for all the modes of transport that I showed, it, it is all liquid CO2 transport, right? So the liquefaction has to happen as close as possible to the um, capture of the CO2 um, as much as possible there are, for example, in, in Denmark, so there's a, a cluster uh, approach called C4CPH, um, and they basically pull together emitters that are in the Copenhagen area and that could potentially share certain infrastructure, for example, liquefaction, for example, a larger um, port uh, or larger jetty in order to be able to have bigger bulk CO2 transport ships come, um, come to that specific point. So. This cluster approach can help, for example, merge several CO2, several emitters into one sort of liquefaction plant um, and share that part, which is quite an expensive one um, when it comes to the capex. Um, but still, so far, most of the projects we see have the capture and liquefaction integrated on site um, for each emitter. Because there's no infrastructure yet for that, right? Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your question.
I've gone over time. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thanks, Eric. Speaking of infrastructure, thank you. Speaking of infrastructure, I think we have uh, Florence on the line, Florence Del Prajano. Hello, Florence. Salut. Bonjour, vous m'entendez? Hi, can you hear me? Oui, mais but can you hear me? Yes, hi Florence. We can hear you. All right, so we can. Perfect. Hello, hi Florence. So uh, thank you for being with us uh, today at this uh, Bex conference. Um, so uh, just maybe for the audience, could you introduce yourself uh, briefly and, and Club CO2, and then we'll have a, a discussion around CO2 infrastructure. Thank you, Karim. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and sorry for not being able to be uh, uh, physically with you uh, today. So I am Florence El Prajano, and I chair uh, the Club CO2, which is a French association that gathers uh, members, French members, that are uh, very active on uh, CC. Ah, okay. Technical issue. Yeah, sorry, we have a technical glitch. Uh, fixing it right now. Or not. Okay, so I think we have a, a small, small glitch here with the remote uh, connection. Uh, are there any um, further questions? Maybe for Emric? Ah. <laughs> oui. Yes, we do. Ah, she's back. Florence is back. Oof. Something you happened. I don't know what, but uh, did, did you, did you, in, in, uh, did you, um, my introduction was okay? Did you hear me? We, we lost you in the middle, Florence, so maybe quickly uh, back just to what is Club CO2 so, and then we, we move on. So, yes, sorry. So I was saying that uh, I, I am sure. Um, I am saying that I, I am chairing the Club CO2, which is a French association that gathers today. 58 French men working on uh, CO2 capture, uh, transport, storage, and utilization. And of course, there are some activities that are re related to uh, bioenergy, particular uh, bioenergy with capital storage and also capital uh, utilization. And of course, when we are looking on these subjects, we are also looking on uh, the way to transport CO2 from uh, the, the site where it is uh, captured to the site where it is stored or used. Okay, thanks. So just we had a presentation earlier on uh, this is one of the challenges to do a carbon removal and, and uh, specifically the BEX methodology. So what can you tell us about the prospect for a CO2 transport infrastructure in, in, in France in the coming, let's say, decade? Okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to recall to everybody that uh, if we want CO2 capture to be deployed, we absolutely need that uh, transport that uh, transport infrastructures are ready at the same time as a. Uh, 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 so we have studied within the Club CO2 this uh, subject and the objective was to uh, collect CO2 in different sites, uh, at different places in France and, trans and transport CO2 towards uh, sites where it can be stored or where it can be utilized. So uh, we have... Uh, 
uh, looked at the scenarios that have been uh, proposed in particular by the French uh, Agency of Energy. Uh, of ecology transitions, and uh, we have different scenario according to the level that we put on CCS. There, uh, 2030 is an important date, and what we see is that. Florence, uh, excusez-moi, est-ce que vous m'entendez? Oui. Florence, vous n'êtes pas sur le bon canal, en fait. Ah. Vous avez choisi le français au lieu de l'anglais. Du coup, vous allez entendre la traduction. Oui, c'est très agréable. Ça, ça vous okay. perturbe un peu. Voilà. Oui, alors attendez. Oh. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. It's better now. Um, what, I say, what I was saying is that uh, 2030 is an important date, and 2030, it is uh, in uh, seven years. So what we observe is that uh, at the first time, so let's say till 20, 2030, we will have the development of uh, infrastructures within some clusters that are close to uh, uh, big emitters. And for example, I am speaking of clusters uh, around Dunkerque. And Dunkerque is uh, an area where there, are a lot, where there are a lot of industries. Uh, in the south of France, also, in particular, around France-sur-Mer, uh, and also in the southwest of France. So we will have some uh, development of infrastructures that will be made up in clusters. And then, to enable uh, CCUS to develop, we will need to develop uh, infrastructures at a larger scale, and in particular, to cover some places of uh, French territories, to be able to make uh, to make connections between uh, areas uh, regions where you can uh, capture CO2 and regions where you need to uh, utilize this CO2 for example to uh, uh, produce e fuels for airports or to to store CO2 in uh, on uh, offshore sites so we have these two 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 places um, if I come back about uh, biogenic CO2, I would like to... Uh, uh, yes, it's, it's good, Florence, we can still hear you. Okay, thank you. So if uh, we, I make a focus on uh, uh, biogenic uh, CO2, I would like to uh, uh, share with you the fact that uh, it will have an important role to play in France. And in particular, uh, you will have the CO2 that uh, will be emit, uh, emitted on sites, on industrial sites when you do a methanization, for example, or pyrogasifications. And these uh, industries are, uh, um, lo are uh, localized on, on different places, so uh, on the territories. And what we observe is that there will be uh, a need for uh, a utilization in particular of a VCO2 to, to produce, for example, things like uh, E-methane, and uh, you will be able to use some infrastructures maybe that are already existing. So this is a, some, uh, at some place, you will be able to use some uh, already existing infrastructures. But for more uh, important CO2 um, uh, transport, and this will appear uh, after 2030, you will need to cover uh, the French territories with some uh, possibility to transport CO2. Okay, so thanks. So it means that, uh, yeah, okay, first uh, a step with clusters with around the big emitters and then yeah. uh, progressively a more distributed infrastructure. Yeah. So you, you believe that at some point we'll have CO2 pipelines in, 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 in France developed beyond 2030? Yes, what, what, uh, what we are uh, studying today is a possibility, of course, to uh, have uh, some pipelines and also you can transport CO2 by, by boat and in particular maybe on the river. So this is something that we are uh, uh, discussing because, of course, the idea is not to cover all the French territories uh, uh, with pipelines, but uh, what we think is that uh, 
it may be very interesting to have a mix, in fact, between pipelines and some other uh, way to transport CO2. But uh, pipelines need to be developed uh, 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 very, uh, uh, they need a lot of, uh, uh, they have time to be developed. So the idea is first to couple pipelines with some other uh, way to transport CO2 and to have um, uh, a development of infrastructures that will be enriched uh, when times go on and uh, with uh, uh, the development of CO2 capture. Okay, thanks a lot. So that's regarding transport. What, what about the storage of CO2? So I understand today in Europe, uh, most of the capacities are around the North Sea. Uh, is there a first potential in other areas like in, in France, for example, or other places in Europe? And uh, if yes, are there plans to try and, and start developing uh, onshore storage capacities? So this, uh, you're fully right, uh, Karen. This is something that uh, we're also discussing within, uh, within the Club CO2 because when you look at the volume of CO2 that uh, will have to be stored, uh, you uh, clearly see that uh, we need to develop uh, some uh, storage uh, at different places. So today, the storage that are uh, most rapidly available are uh, storage in the North Sea and uh, with some projects that are already uh, uh, far uh, close to the, uh, the operations. And uh, these uh, storage sites will be okay for uh, regions and in particular French regions that are close to the North Sea. However, uh, from other regions, we also need to provide some storage sites. And these storage sites could be offshore, but if they are offshore, maybe uh, it will cost us uh, 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 money. So uh, uh, it will uh, put a price on the CO2 capture uh, transport and storage that uh, will be too important. So the idea also to look at onshore storage that can be closer to uh, some emitters, even if they are uh, these storage are big storage sites, but the idea is also that due to uh, societal perception of uh, the use of the subsoil and in particular of CO2 storage, the idea is first to develop offshore storage and then to see whether we can store CO2 onshore. And here we have also uh, we are convinced that we have uh, the capacity to store CO2, but uh, we have to go deeper in the studies to, uh, uh, um, to study more precisely where exactly we can store CO2. And this could be in France or also in countries that are close to France. Okay, thanks. And last question for you, Florence. I know you have a train to, to jump in, but uh, uh, how do you see the level of support of French authorities for generally a CO2 infrastructure development? Uh, the support of French authority uh, is coming. Uh, we uh, are today discussing with the French authorities to uh, develop a roadmap for the development of CCUS, so uh, CO2 capture uh, and uh, transport and storage, and uh, we are also discussing about utilizations. So, as I said, it is very important to put the development of, of infrastructures on the paper, and we are discussing with French authorities on the development of infrastructures because if uh, France wants to reach carbon neutrality, then uh, we'll need to capture CO2, and to capture CO2, we need to have infrastructures that uh, enable uh, industries that have capped their CO2 to uh, transport and store their CO2 so somewhere. So uh, the support of French uh, authorities is uh, clear now and uh, we are discussing to make it uh, a reality. Okay, thank you very much, Florence. Are there any questions for, uh, for, for Florence before we, we go to the last presentation today? Okay, no, so that's fine. Merci beaucoup, Florence, thank thanks, thanks a lot. So much. And bye, bye-bye. So now, time, last but not least, Nick from Future Biogas, please. Thank you very much. Oh, do I need to press on Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for making it to the, uh, the last presentation of the session. Uh, hopefully, yeah, last but not least. Uh, so by means of introduction, I'm, uh, I'm Nick Primer. I'm the policy advisor for Future Biogas. Um, and this presentation will mainly be about our developments into creating the UK's first BEX AD plant in the UK. 
So as a bit of a background, uh, Future Biogas is currently the largest or at least one of the largest biomethane producers in the UK, uh, operating 11 plants, 10 of which are upgrading that biogas into biomethane to produce just shy of 500 gigawatt hours of biomethane per year. Um, and as you can see, these plants are primarily located in the east of England, in the sort of arable agricultural heart of the of of England. So, as a, as lots of the presentations have said today, that there is this growing need for removals. Um, you know, it's not enough to reduce emissions. Uh, removals are essential to balance those unavoidable emissions for net zero. Uh, and looking at the UK strategy for net zero in particular, you can see we've got to create an entire market from scratch. At the moment, there is neg negligible levels of greenhouse gas removals in the UK. And yet in 35 years, we need to scale that from zero to 81 million tons of CO2 removal per year. So an exponential growth is required to deliver that target. Um, you know, extremely ambitious, ambi ambitious change is required. Um, and there are sort of two main ways of delivering those removals. Uh, again, a lot of this has sort of been mentioned before, but just to sort of split it into these two camps, you have your engineered removals. So that's your capturing of CO2 gas and storage in, um, in geological reserves and, and, and structures. And then you also have your nature-based uh, removals. So that can be increasing soil uh, carbon sequestration and growth of new forests and woody biomass. Both of these, though, are required for net zero. We can't, we can't just focus on one or the other, and both have significant uh, pros and cons on either side. So your engineered removals, as mentioned, you know, they're permanent, relatively low risk, but at the moment, based on the current technology, they're expensive. On the other side, your nature-based removals, they're a lot cheaper. They can deliver wider positive externalities, such as improvements to biodiversity with the growth of a new forest. But in balance, you know, they're also not permanent. They will re-release that carbon back into the atmosphere, and that can help, that can make it difficult to quantify the sort of net removals benefit. But again, like I say, both are required. And I think this is where the anaerobic digestion sector um, presents some, uh, some really important opportunities because an AD plant can deliver both engineered removals and nature-based removals. You've got your CO2, uh, your bio-CO2 stream coming off your bi uh, biogas upgrading process and also your production of digestate, an organic rich fibrous biofertilizer, which when to spread to land helps replenish soil organic carbon. And here lies uh, the part of, of Future Biogas's current developments and what we're working on now. So we, we've called this project Project Carbon Harvest because what it does is change the focus away from just energy. You know, an AD plant is not just an energy site, energy generator, it is a manager of carbon. And through that, we can create a low carbon green gas, biomethane, and also this bi stream of bio CO2 suitable for permanent storage. And then again, we create this uh, low carbon biofertilizer for agricultural systems. So we're decarbonizing three key sectors. You've, you've got your decarbonization of agriculture, decarbonization of energy, and your contribution to uh, carbon removals. Uh, and in particular, the, this, uh, the, the removal side of this project is gonna be in partnership with the Northern Lights project. So the, the storage facility in the North Sea, um, on the sort of Norwegian side of the North Sea, uh, which and Northern Lights being a joint venture between Equinor, Shell and Total. So as a bit of an overview at this project carbon harvest we're looking uh, to develop, we're, we're hoping to build up to 25 new large scale BEX sites across the UK. Uh, each of these will be operating at scale, producing biomethane and CO2 but also retrofit CCS technology to existing biomethane plants. At the moment, biomethane, because the focus is on energy, plants are only designed to generate biomethane. And all of that valuable bio-CO2 is simply being vented to atmosphere. And that may be carbon neutral, 
but it's such a waste of a such a valuable resource. So we're looking to retrofit up to 20, new, uh, 20 existing plants with the CCS technology to feed in this stream of bioCO2. And all of this bioCO2 will be aggregated in the Humber region in the UK, all of which going to storage. And in total, uh, if with full deployment of the project, we're looking at about 400,000 tonnes of bioCO2 being stored every single year, uh, which is, well, it's about 40% uh, of the UK target for 2030. So quite a, a significant sort of kickstart to, uh, to that need for a growing removals industry. Uh, so a closer look at each BEX plant we're looking to develop. So each one will be about this in size. So producing about 150 gigawatt hours of biomethane per year. And that will lead to a greenhouse gas saving by displacing fossil natural gas to the tune of about 27 and a half thousand tons of CO2. Then also each plant would produce uh, about 21,000 tons of bio CO2 for storage. And then also the bio fertilizer digestate when spread to land, all of it will be spread to land. Um, you know, delivering those uh, savings from the displacement of artificial fertilizers, as well as the temporary nature-based solution uh, storage of about 3.4 thousand tons of CO2 per year. And again, it's important to say, while, while this, um, that carbon may be temporarily stored in the soil, this repeated application will be done annually. You know, digestate will be spread to land every year. So the effect is permanent, even if a single molecule of carbon is only temporarily stored. So I think that's a, an important note to make is repeated processes can lead to de facto permanent emissions. They just need to be balanced and effectively uh, accounted for within the market. And crucially, all of this, all of Project Carbon Harvest will be operated uh, without the need for government subsidies. Uh, by, by accessing and nurturing the, the growing market for removals, we, can, we believe we can operate this without the need for subsidies. So, the existing AD industry in the UK and across Europe has really been supported and, and driven by government support, tariff rates and the like. And at the moment, for example, in the UK, the Green Gas Support Scheme, the uh, GGSS, can provide the majority of a plant's income, uh, all based on that energy focus. But by shifting the focus towards carbon and creating an unsubsidized green gas, as well as uh, green gas removals through CO2 store, storage, uh, we believe our business case can stack, stack up and you know, break that dependence on subsidy. And crucially, you know, by being unsubsidized, all of these carbon savings and carbon removals are fully additional. And we're seeing an increasing um, understanding from clients and customers that they want this additional green gas. They don't want to be bitten in a few years time by people saying, you know, you've, the, your, the carbon savings you're claiming aren't legitimate because they're not additional or they're being funded by government support. So, um, so we are seeing a, a strong, uh, you know, high value is being placed on this unsubsidized uh, products, uh, services. And we can see that within the sort of voluntary carbon market already. Um, so as I mentioned before, you have your different uh, solutions and different options for removals. And you can see your permanent high integrity solutions such as BEX and DAX are currently being priced at similar levels, high levels, 300 plus dollars uh, per ton. And then your lower value, maybe more temporary nature-based solutions uh, selling for, for cheaper prices, but again, both being necessary for net zero. And uh, all of our plants under this BISPEC scheme will be sourced from bioenergy crops. And uh, we see strong links with tackling key farming challenges. And many of these UK-based farming challenges can also be true across, the, across Europe. So firstly, we're seeing at least in the UK, um, you know, a loss of the support from the EU, you know, following Brexit. 
so the financial model of farms is being strained and they're now looking for new sources of income and diversification of, of, of their income to make ends meet. We're seeing widespread soil degradation from unsustainable practices, uh, you know, monocropping of uh, monocropping, uh, heavy tillage routines, um, heavy use of artificial fertilizers and pesticides and her herbicides. And all of this is contributing to a degradation in soil quality and health and a loss of soil carbon. So here is where we can come in and start addressing some of these, these issues by implementing a diverse crop rotation, where over a course of five, six, seven years, different crops are being grown, and only one out of the five is being sent to AD, you're, in, you're nourishing a, uh, you're, you're, you're creating a system where um, you're not needing as many artificial inputs and chemical, chemical inputs to maintain that level of productivity. Uh, and by, by sending one of those crops to AD, you're diversifying the agricultural income and returning that digestate back to land to further improve soil health and displace uh, artificial fertilizers. So we're seeing this as a, a solution to both f fuel and food, uh, when often the argument levied against us is, you know, is, is it food versus fuel? And we say, no, it's, it's food and fuel. And uh, I think this approach has benefits to all the different stakeholders involved. To the farmer, you've got a long-term sustainable offtake, uh, diversification of income, and an improvement of the soil quality and health for the long term. To future biogas, we get f uh, feedstock security. We can work with these farmers to know exactly what we're putting into our plants, which benefits uh, LCAs, which benefits um, you know evidencing biomass sustainability requirements and helps us understand what we're, what environmental benefit we're delivering. And of course, there is the benefit to the environment, improves uh, soil health, biodiversity, water retention, and crucially reduce those, carb, uh, those greenhouse gas emissions. And also to the UK, this approach helps break that dependence and subsidies you know, this is a, a blueprint that could be applied to any biomethane plant in the UK, theoretically. And if successful, could save the government millions of pounds from tariff supports that are currently propping up the industry. And all the while helping deliver the net zero target by 2050. So, um, so that's Project Carbon Harvest. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And any questions? Uh, thanks, Dr. Belk Masaye, Bioenergy. Thanks for the presentation. There's not so many people here anymore, so sorry for that. Um, just, a, just a question. So, so you mentioned energy crops uh, as as input. Do you also include manure um, in in your centralized uh, digesters? And and how do you um, how do you involve the farmers in in this strategy? Are they just suppliers, or are they also part of the business in in the cooperative or something? Good question. Um, so at the moment, no, the, the manure is not part of the, the story we're looking to develop. That's primarily because uh, the UK's agricultural sector is really quite split. So in the, in the west of England is where you have your livestock, and that is where you get a lot of the manure. And in the east of England is where you get your, your arable heartland. There's, there's very strong cropping potential. So there's already a bit of a disparity across England. And that's part of the, um, the attractive proposition to farmers is they need an organic fertilizer. So digestate can come in where manures aren't necessarily available. Um, I think on a broader term, we are focusing on crops because there are also complications with, uh, as, we, as we've been seeing in other countries, the intensification of livestock that uh, the solutions to which I'm not exactly sure uh, how, how, how to tackle. So I think, yeah, we're, we're sticking with the crops. Cool. Thank you.
Okay, well, thanks, Nick, and thank uh, thank everyone for your patience uh, getting us uh, two solid, more than two solid full hours on this topic. Uh, so, uh, it was a uh, thank again for your for your participation to the panelists, and uh, uh, feel free to feel to to be in touch if you have any questions or comments. Bye.